Today on On TV Update, a new form of cancer treatment comes to Syracuse. Also, a museum downtown is using Women's History Month to take a fresh look at their art collection. This and more coming up in the hour. Now, from the EMC studio at Onondaga Community College, this is an On TV Update. Good afternoon and welcome to On TV Update. This is Friday, March 6th. I'm Michael Knight. And I'm Mason Merritt. We begin today with breaking news. The NCAA is expected to discuss infractions committed by the Syracuse University men's basketball team, concluding an investigation spanning several years. Last month, the university announced a self-imposed ban of postseason play. It is not clear what punishment they'll face from the NCAA, and a news conference is scheduled for 1 o'clock today. In other news this morning, proton therapy is a new way to fight cancer, and Upstate Medical Center is adding it to their arsenal. On TV's Ian Dwyer went to the hospital to learn more. Like radiation therapy, proton therapy uses specific lasers to treat the cancer within the patient's body. Dr. Jeffrey Bogart is leading the push for Upstate to start treating patients using proton therapy. The radiation is kind of deposited along the way up to where you define and then completely is given off. So it can do a much better job in certain instances of protecting the surrounding area. By using proton therapy over traditional radiation treatments, doctors are able to better treat the cancer by sending the protons directly to the cancer. Today on On TV Update, a new form of cancer treatment comes to Syracuse. Also, a museum downtown is using Women's History Month to take a fresh look at their art collection. This and more are coming up in the hour. Now, from the EMC studio at Onondaga Community College, this is an On TV Update. Good afternoon and welcome to On TV Update. This is Friday, March 6th. I'm Michael Knight. And I'm Mason Merritt. We begin today with breaking news. The NCAA is expected to discuss infractions committed by the Syracuse University men's basketball team, concluding an investigation spanning several years. Last month, the university announced a self-imposed ban of postseason play for this season. It's not clear what punishment they'll face from the NCAA. A news conference has been scheduled for 1 o'clock today. In other news this morning, proton therapy is a new way to fight cancer, and Upstate Medical Center is adding it to their arsenal. On TV's Ian Dwyer went to the hospital to learn more. Like radiation therapy, proton therapy uses specific lasers to treat the cancer within the patient's body. Dr. Jeffrey Bogart is leading the push for Upstate to start treating patients using proton therapy. The radiation is kind of deposited along the way up to where you define and then completely is given off. So it can do a much better job in certain instances of protecting the surrounding area. By using proton therapy over traditional radiation treatments, doctors are able to better treat the cancer by sending the protons directly to the cancer cells and significantly reducing the effect on the surrounding cells. By using a specific formula, doctors are able to determine what percent of the proton beam they will need to use to reach the cancer cells. 
Like traditional radiation therapy, proton therapy uses a mask like this to immobilize the patient during treatment, so the lasers don't have to be recalibrated every time they're treated. Proton therapy is the most specified cancer treatment available, which from a patient's perspective, can't get any better. I think proton is, is clearly uh, very uh, superior to, to X-ray radiation. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that, uh, you know, the, that uh, the Upstate uh, Cancer Center here is looking to, to uh, put in a proton uh, 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 cyclotron here in order to have proton therapy right, right here in our own town. From the Upstate Cancer Center, I'm Ian DeWire for On TV Update. Upstate is hoping to start construction on their new facility early next spring. For more information, go to upstate.edu. The people of East Syracuse have had more than 100 inches of snow to deal with this winter. Removing that much snow has always been a challenge. On TV's George Arnold investigates the village's sidewalk snowplow that has been stirring up controversy among its residents. Plowing the sidewalks has been a regular service in the village of East Syracuse. Any time three or more inches of the snow hits, the plows come out. But for Jane Hillenbrand, snow isn't the only thing these plows have taken with them. It tends to chew up the edges of your lawn really badly and chunks of dirt and stuff in the spring and it's a mess. The weeds tend to grow through those clumps of dirt and it's very um, ugly, frankly, for those who like to keep up their lawns. And given the plow's unpopularity, it has become a more appealing target for the village budget cuts it needs to make this year as Ron Russell calculates its cost. $10,000 in wages, be it uh, you know straight time and overtime, and fuel average is about 8 to 10 gallons a trip. Overall, it'll, uh, bad year, maybe 10 to $12,000, not including any repairs that have to be made. Losing the plows would lower taxes for the community, but would leave the plowing up to the people. Well, the snow plows, the residents of Syracuse will have to shovel the sidewalks themselves. I personally wouldn't mind, because I, I shovel practically three driveways in the um, front sidewalk already. So to do a little more, it probably wouldn't matter to me personally. However, the plow has been in danger of being cut before and has managed to survive. So some neighbors may still have their work cut out for them come springtime. From East Syracuse, I'm George Arnold for On TV Update. There will be a budget meeting in April to discuss cuts, including the snowplow service, and the meeting will be open to the public. While snow may be causing problems for East Syracuse residents, you won't hear Central New York snowmobilers complaining. According to the 2011 Snowmobile Owner Survey, snowmobilers in New York spent an estimated $434 million during that winter. Reporter Justin Bergen gives us a behind-the-scenes look at the work done to keep that money flowing. Fantastic. Behind me is the starting point of a common snowmobile trail that extends over 100 miles. And who's left to take care of those 100 miles? Well, that's your local snowmobile club. Battered by relentless snowfall and the flood of riders, repairs on these trails are endless. Manned by the Snowmobile Club volunteers, this giant machine takes care of some of those repairs. Club volunteers spend an average of six hour shifts from dusk till dawn grooming these trails, making them smooth for riders. Members also put up signs and contact property owners along the way. Maintaining a fun and safe ride for these snowmobilers is important for keeping them riding and buying locally. Some local cross-country skiers and dog walkers are also enjoying these freshly groomed trails. Overall, a lot of hard work goes into running these trails, and club owners are always looking for more help. You know, it's not really that easy. There's a lot of volunteer hours that go on to make it all happen, and we can always use, every club could use more help. The neat thing about these snowmobile clubs is they're run by snowmobilers for snowmobilers. And if you want to join a club today, it usually runs about $45. I'm Justin Bergen in Camillus on TV Update. While volunteers are still needed, the number of memberships has nearly quadrupled in the last five years. The Beat Street Music Store has seen a change of the culture in today's music. On TV's Ryan Polito talks with the owner in order to solve this mystery. Nestled in the rural serenity of Manlius, New York, Terry Vickery of the Beat Street Music Shop cares to the most discerning professional player as well as the aspiring one. Over the years, Terry has seen a steady flow of old and new musicianship. With all the talent moving in and out, 
One would think that there has been a steady increase in musicians. However, according to Terry, this is the exact opposite. I gotta be honest with you, I think there's less musicians around today. Less and less kids of your generation are learning how to play this stuff because they're spending more time with their Nintendo, if you will, and less time playing an instrument. The fact is that very few people put the time into it. This could be due to the effect the internet has produced. You could just simulate any music with software, but it doesn't quite work that way with playing an actual instrument. Anybody with a guitar will say that they're a musician, but they're not. They're just a guy with a guitar. You really should never buy any instrument without playing it first. If you can't play it, you don't know how it feels, you don't know how it sounds. Playing an instrument, it's like painting with sound. Even during a downtrend like seen today, Terry will do everything he can to keep the flame of real music alive, such as attending the Guitar League, which promotes the most heritage by drawing guitar aficionados together to inspire one another. All kinds of guitar players, they show up, I think it's the first Monday or Tuesday of every month. That's when they have their meetings. They get some really incredibly talented guitar players to come in several times a year. Great place to go if you're playing guitar, learning how to play guitar, beginner, novice, expert. It's, there's something there for everybody. Although the culture has seen a period of stagnation, the spirit of music certainly lives on. Thanks in part to the efforts of people like Terry Vickery, the New York music scene still has roots deep and strong. Everything goes in cycles, and it's just a matter of time before the area produces its next shining star. Ryan Polito on TV Update. And if you're interested in checking out the Guitar League yourself, you can check out their website at guitarleague.com for more details. The Everson Art Museum has been open to the public since 1968. In all of its time hosting exhibits, it has never once had a showroom dedicated solely to the works of women, created only by women themselves. On February 7th of this year, that changed. On TV's Michaela Fiato has more on the story. The month of March is dedicated to celebrating women's history. The Everson Museum is recognizing the achievements of women by opening its brand new art exhibit, Women's Works. So the works featured in this exhibition are all part of the Everson's permanent collection. However, many of them haven't been on view in quite some time, actually many years. And the inspiration and the impetus for this show really came as um, a counterpart to our leading exhibition, Prendergast to Pollock. However, it did not include any female artists, which we wanted to counteract and balance that out within the museum galleries by having an exhibition solely dedicated to women feminist artists. If you're interested in seeing any of the art at the Women's Exhibit, it will be open until May 10th. Reporting here from the Everson Museum, I'm on TV's Michaela Fiato. If you would like to know even more about the new exhibit and future exhibits, visit the Everson Museum homepage for more info. From downtown Syracuse to OCC's campus, a new exhibiting is opening up at the college. Local artist Colleen Wolpert brings photography, video, interactive pieces, and interactive pieces to the gallery. Wilper says she was inspired by film technology created right here in Syracuse. She used the idea of how it projects light to create art that the viewer is encouraged to interact with. The show runs through April 14th at the Ann Felton Multicultural Center. Tim Lewis gives you your five-day forecast. He also sheds some light on why CNY snow is so unique. Also, we're talking with Seth Rizzo, who discusses why the U.S. is falling behind in technology education and what we can do about it. Stay tuned. My experiences have been amazing. I love my professors. All of the students are super outgoing. We do things outside of class together, which is really great. We go to movies together. We go to lunch together. It's really fun. When you get along with the people that you go to school with, you do better at everything in your life. Uh, it's been a good experience. I've had a lot of fun, did a lot of work, learned about a lot of new things. 
I learned about hardware, software, basically electronics and computers on a much grander scale involving both software and hardware. It's a good college. If you, if you are in the technology department or in, you're in the Whitney building, uh, I would say that's a good place. <laughs> My name is Nicholas Holdersky and I am a math science major here at Onondaga Community College. When I first got here I barely had any driving experience. It was a really great opportunity for me to come down here in the beginning of September I believe and it was great for me to drive here every day when the snow started to fly. It's nice having your own car and being able to go out with your friends whenever you want to. I've met some really wonderful people here and especially for somebody who's a younger driver, somebody who's just learning, it's really just a great experience to have. They say nothing beats seeing something amazing for the first time. Whether it be a good book you read, or a song you heard, the Barnes & Noble bookstore would make sure to amaze you. Especially if it's your first time. Come visit us today. Visit our website, onadagacc.bncollege.com for more information. Welcome back to On TV Update. I'm Michael Knight. And I'm Mason Merritt. We may be nice and warm here in the uh, studio, but Tim Lewis is outside braving the elements to get you your weather report. How is it looking for us this week, Tim? Well, this week isn't looking as bad compared to what it has been for the past couple weeks. There's a little bit of snow predicted in the beginning of the week, but nothing serious. And temperatures are going to be rising from the low 20s to the high... Um, of 30 is above freezing at the end of the week. Um, according to Jim Teske's forecast at localsyr.com, today is going to be cold with sun and clouds and a high around 20s with winds out of the southwest around 10 to 5 miles per hour. Saturday we will have a 30% chance of snow showers with a high in the low 30s and winds coming out of the west southwest around 8 to 10 miles per hour. Sunday is going to be a little bit nicer with, with mostly cloudy conditions and a high around 32. Monday we have a 30% chance of snow or rain, showers with a high in the mid 30s. Be careful driving on Sunday since the roads may be slippery. On Tuesday we might finally get a break from winter with sun and clouds predicted and a high around 45 degrees. Now everyone who lives in central New York is familiar with lake effect snow, but do you really know what the difference is between lake effect snow and regular snow? and why it can make travel a nightmare? Here's some more information on lake effect snow. Every winter in central New York, lake effect snow falls seemingly all the time. This lake effect snow is caused by the Great Lakes. Matt Stevens, a local meteorologist at Channel 3 CNY Central, has more about what causes lake effect snow. Uh, lake effect snow is often very localized. As a matter of fact, that's one of the hallmarks of lake effect snow. It's extraordinarily localized, often into very narrow bands, sometimes less than a quarter mile wide. You can go from absolutely no snow whatsoever to near whiteout conditions. So the, the processes that form lake effect snow versus storm snow are wildly different. When you have this warm body of water and the cold air passing over it, automatically that air down close to the surface of the water is being warmed by the water. It wants to rise on its own. In doing so, it cools, it condenses, and it produces the lake effect clouds and ultimately the lake effect snow. Not only when lake effect snowfalls can accumulate in huge amounts, but it also can lead to dangerous driving conditions. Tyler Winkleman, a lifelong resident to central New York, knows all about the challenges and danger of driving in lake effect snow. You, you see cars off the road all the time, especially up here in uh, like central New York. Lake effect snow is something that you have to get used to in central New York winters, but should still use caution while traveling in it. This is Tim Lewis on TV News. So when there is lake effect snow falling, you should plan on leaving early because it delays on the roads. And if you get caught in it, drive slow. It's better to be 10 minutes late than to end up in a ditch for two hours. Now back to you guys in the studio. The U.S. is ranked last in the top 20 education systems of the world. The state of our country's education rests in the hands of our colleges and universities. Today we have Seth Rizzo, an accomplished engineer, to talk to us more about the importance in higher education. All right, so Seth, thank you for joining us today on um, 
on TV update. So Seth, the US has been falling uh, behind in education on a worldwide scale. Really, according to uh, the Pearson Education, the US is ranked 14th in education, while places like South Korea and Japan are at the top. Why do you, why do you think, in your opinion, why do you think that uh, the US is being ranked so low? Well, first, before I say anything, I'd like to congratulate you guys on your Emmy win. Very well deserved. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we have to look at the statistics a little bit on what they're actually, um, what they're actually calculating in those statistics. I think mm -hmm. America has a tendency, which is a good thing, to mm -hmm. uh, try and give everybody a chance. And I think right. in a lot of these Asian countries, a lot of, uh, a lot of people fail out or a lot of people don't make it to the higher education system, whereas in America, even people with disabilities are able to mm -hmm. get a higher education. Right. Okay, well, so what do you think will happen because of this whole thing going on? What do you think will happen if the U.S. does not step up on getting more students interested in education? Well, Mike, what I would say to that mm -hmm. is everybody's responsible for themselves, right? So if the government's not doing something to help you in higher education, it's the student's responsibility to get their education one way or another and find mm -hmm. a way to succeed if, they, if that's what they want to do. Okay. All right, then, well, in, in your opinion, here's the next question. In your opinion, what could we do to bring more students to our colleges and universities? Uh, let's see. I believe we need to stop coddling a lot of our students. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe there was a recent school board meeting right here in central New York where it's mandated that only 10% of a, of a student's grade could be homework. Oh, I see. And I believe that's uh, indicative of the rest of the country. I think if we challenge our students a little bit more, mm -hmm. I, think, uh, I think we'll do better in higher education. And I'd also like to add that I am not an expert on the topic. Mm -hmm. And despite my confidence, <laughs> well, you really shouldn't listen to me. At least you have the confidence. Thank that you. matters a lot. Well, thank you, Seth, for joining us today here and on, t on TV Update, and giving us a few pointers on education in the U.S. And it was a really great pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay. Hopefully in the future, we can find a way for more students to be interested in higher education and bring the U.S. back on top. For more information on the U.S. education rankings and more, visit rankingamerica.wordpress.com. If you're a sophomore planning to transfer this, tall, this fall, you'd better start looking at your options now. College deadlines for transfer admission can range from as late as July to as soon as March. OCC's Advising Center recommends contacting an advisor who can walk you through the process. They also have admissions officers from many four-year schools visiting throughout the semester. Stop by the Advising Center in Gordon, in the Gordon Student Center to set up your counseling. Sports is next. Sports anchor Joseph Viola brings us an update on what the men's soccer team is doing to prepare for their upcoming season. I am Jim Spagnola. I am a percussionist. I did a lot of marching band and a lot of percussion ensemble in high school, and I decided to audition here as one of my schools out of high school. The new building is a far cry better than where we were before. The percussion room was about a third of the size of this room, and it also doubled as half the storage we had had access to. The percussion studio has a very strong bond between members, and it's a great program to be a part of. The summer after I graduated from OCC, I came back because there was an EOP program um, taking students who had just come out of high school and kind of transitioning them into college life. The students lived in the dorms and then they went to classes and then got tutoring. So even after I graduated, I was able to come back and still be involved and you know help the next class of students be successful. Because even when I went to school afterwards, when I went on for the bachelor's and for the master's, you don't you really don't find like as much support anywhere else as you do at OCC. I am in the choir. I'm in the concert choir and OCC singers. And Dr. Dari is a great, great, great conductor. He really wants to know you and your personality, where you come from. He just really cares about us and it shows. As soon as I joined the choir, I was talking to people at the auditions. People here, they're not afraid to say like, hi, my name is, and really get to know you. OCC is like your second home. I really feel like I have a family here. It's that time again, finals! And after finals, it's Christmas! 
But before Christmas, it's Christmas shopping! We don't have time to go somewhere far away to do our Christmas shopping. But not to worry, you have the OCC Barnes & Noble College Bookstore! Books aren't the only thing you can find here. In fact, there's a gift for everyone. From beautiful warm hoodies of all sizes to new backpacks, shirts of all colors, Christmas gifts, and even supplies for next semester. So don't be a Scrooge this Christmas. Be the life of the holidays. Come down to the OCC Bookstore located in the Whitney Atrium. Open normal business hours. See website for details. Welcome back to On TV Update. I'm Joe Viola, and this is a sports report. The men's basketball team here at Onondaga Community College has just finished their season with 16 wins and 13 losses. They had a devastating loss to Finger Lakes Community College, 80 to 57, to end their season in the semifinals of the MSAC Championship. The, the basketball team practices here at the SRC Arena as they usually prepare for the next game on their schedule. Now that the season is over, the team can now train to get mentally prepared for the upcoming season as they build on this season's success. Coach David Pasek has been head coach for the team for 14 years and has an overall record of 239 wins and 182 um, losses. Always going to be a transition team. We try to play at a criti uh, pretty quick pace because I think that, one, is it's fun for kids to play that way and allows you to engage more people and rewards depth and all those kinds of things. Coach Pacek showed me highlights of the season as he describes what it'll be like without having his sophomores from this season. Of our scoring, rebounding, assists, so forth and so on. So, uh, I mean, it's a two part thing. Our returning players, uh, it's an opportunity for them to continue to develop and, and step into more significant roles, um, you know, which we're, we're counting on all of them doing that. With the season coming to an end in dramatic fashion, but so Coach Pacek gives his team the edge with his 14th season coming to an end. The OCC men's soccer team is already hard at work getting ready for the upcoming fall season. Both Jeff Valencia and McCain Spalding are hitting the ground running by taking the offseason seriously for next year. The men's soccer team had an overall record last season of 11 wins and 8 losses winning seven of the 11 games at home at Murphy Field. They hope to improve this record next year. The team is already hard at work for next fall. What we're doing this off season is we uh, have practices three times a week, Monday, uh, Wednesday, Fridays. Every Mondays and Wednesdays we got lifting with a strength conditioning coach and a fat athlete room. And uh, Fridays we have practice in the gym and we just do our footwork, running and stuff, kicking the ball around, you know. Some of the OCC soccer players have taken it upon themselves to go out and create indoor teams outside of coach practices to stay in shape and keep their touch on the ball. Outside of our um, coach being here, we have a couple practices a week. Um, over the weekend, we have a couple games, a couple of the guys, they play in together so that we're staying fit and keeping our touch together. Even though the team is stuck inside, they're using their gym time wisely by conditioning and running through drills with high intensity. Valencia and Spragling already know what the team needs to do in order to succeed in the fall. What we need to work on is uh, our team chemistry because next year we'll have a brand new team because all the sophomores graduated. So just can't wait to see the new recruits, see how they are, bond together and stuff, make sure that we're good for next season, you know. And I'm Andy Mitiga with your On TV Update. The returning soccer players are eager to get to play with the new recruits so they can start gaining chemistry. It seems the men's soccer team is really working to make next season a successful one. Yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be an exciting one to watch. Uh, just uh, several more months to go, I suppose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're looking to travel to exotic locations during your time at college, there's a club on campus you can join. We also have your community events calendar for the upcoming week, all coming up after the break. small class sizes. I love the affordability. I love the convenience. Career opportunities. The diversity. Our campus. The great community. I love. I love. I love. I love Onondaga. I love Onondaga. I love Onondaga. I love Onondaga. I 
I'm a human services major um, with a concentration in social work. I love my major because it is giving me the skills and abilities and knowledge to be able to help people in crisis. The academics are great. I, they're challenging. Choir is great because it, you can you are with music majors and non-music majors, and we all come together to make music. Dr. Rodari is very good at making you feel listened to, and he obviously cares. He is interested in you, not just as a student, but you as a human being. So since I've started at OCC, I've seen an immense improvement in my photography work. All the teachers at OCC are very professional in the way they teach and in the way they handle the classroom. In my basic photography class, the teacher really encouraged hands-on work. You know, because of the photography program at OCC, I have something to look forward to. If you're looking for some things to do in the upcoming week, here are a few events happening around the area. $5 Flashback Mondays start at the Palace Theater this Monday. It runs through May 18th and features classic films such as The Princess Bride, My Cousin Vinny, and The Breakfast Club. Showtime is at 7 p.m. You can go to the Palace on James, palaceonjames.com for, for a full list of movie playing. And stand-up comedy classes will be taking place tomorrow at the CNY Playhouse in Shopping Town Mall. The class runs for six weeks and covers all aspects of being a working comedian. It ends in a public performance. It costs seventy-five dollars. You can visit cnyplayhouse.com to sign up. If you feel like braving the cold, it's the last weekend for horse-drawn sleigh rides at Highland Forest. Rides are six dollars per person, three dollars for kids five and under, and are first come, first serve. Sets are running from 11 to 3.30. And if you feel like uh, braving some public scrutiny, Funkin' Waffles weekly open mic night takes place this Wednesday at their SDU Campus Hill location. Sign-ups start at 7.30, shows at 8. One of the most exciting things for most students about college is the ability to diversify and have new experiences in settings you didn't expect to find yourself in. A good example of this is the History Club. The organization has visited multiple continents in its eight-year history, with many more to come. Here at OCC, there is no shortage of clubs to choose from. What sets the History Club apart, though, from others is its affinity for travel. Even though it is well into the semester, it is not too late to join and experience what the world has to offer. Professor Rick McLean is the faculty supervisor in charge of setting up and overseeing the club's numerous excursions. We've been on trips all over the northeastern United States, Canada, uh, Puerto Rico, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras. Uh, so we've had a very active club and the trips have been very popular. One of the biggest things that the History Club offers is the economics of travel. You can get around uh, ch much cheaper than you would normally. For instance, uh, for the History Club, they offer $50. To, you can share a room, $80 if you want your own bed. And a food, other expenses is up to you. If you want to do it independently, Sheridan Downtown Hotel, $139 a night. Delta Airlines, $297 ticket. And if you want to take the bus, Amtrak bus is $72. Exposure to such a wide array of cultures can end up having a longer lasting impact than Club Vice President Joe Giamartino may have anticipated. If it weren't for History Club, um, I, I wouldn't have changed my major. So I think it's very important that the college allow this to happen. The club most recently visited the Yucatan Mountains and will be visiting Philadelphia in the coming weeks. As of right now, they're planning a trip to Puerto Rico for spring break. The meetings are held on Wednesdays in room 345 in Mawinney during college hour if you'd like more information. The Student Leadership and Engagement Office on Onondaga's campus helps students create clubs and organizations, and they also sponsor on-campus and off-campus activities for all students. The OCC Office of Student Leadership and Engagement help plan events for students on and off campus. Blaze Bender, Romeo Capolo, 
are two active members of the department. Bender says his office hopes clubs meet the campus rules for events and planning. So some of the requirements that they have to go to is that their clubs have to be open for everybody. Um, in addition to that, they're going to need a constitution as well as participate in the three mandatory events. They have to do one on-campus event, they have to do one off-campus event, and they also have to participate in party on the quad. The Office of Student Leadership and Engagement not only sponsors events on campus and off campus for students, but it also has this rec room that is paid for through your student fees. All you have to do is come here, relax, and have a good time. Coppolo says that it doesn't matter if you commute or if you live on campus, that the rec room is open to all. They just want students to come and have a good time. You can come whatever you want, at least if it's open, you can go play video game, have fun with your friend, do everything you want. Vega inside, Vega PS3, PS4, Nintendo, all kind of game. Just come to here. If you like stressful in class, if you have too much work, just come here, relax, and after you can go to class or you can just go home. This one is open to everyone. It's no, it's no matter who you are or whatever. Just you have to have fun. Just come here and you're gonna have fun with your friend. Live from the rec room on Onondaga's campus, I'm Red Billy for On TV Update. The rec center is located in the lower level of the Gor of Gordon Center for ping pong, video games, snacks, and more. With retention rates dropping every year, education officials are looking into potential reasons for this phenomenon. On TV's Drew Mertens has the story. Students are dropping out of college at a frightening rate. With the previous recorded retention rate being approximately 55% at Onondaga Community College, more and more people are worrying about college dropouts than ever before. The overflow of work and financial issues can become a major lead in the dropping out for many students. Business Office Coordinator Tim Jordan had to drop out because of these very reasons. I never found a way to not lose something at any given time. I mean, you're going to have to drop something. But when I dropped eating to work, then you have an issue. When I dropped homework to, do, uh, uh, to pay for gas to go to work, um, then you have a bigger issue. You start, your grades start dropping like crazy. Literally every trade-off is... is leading up to a bigger one and it gets to the point where one thing falls by the wayside and if that one thing was school then you're going to drop out. Students are highly recommended to visit their educational advisor in order to manage their schedules to appropriately tackle the workload so they don't have to cut anything important. Educational advisor Darian Gregory finds that advisors should work with students in order to help find a way to balance both schedules. If advisors and faculty could work with students to talk to them about how to manage their time and you know, you would probably do a lot better if you only take two classes or you could do full-time classes if you work 25 hours a week and students could see that and then see their success, like managing smaller chunks of their life at one time, then they would stay longer. It is hoped that the advisement of students will bring about a significant decrease in the number of students dropping out. In the Gordon Student Center, I'm Drew Mertens from On TV Update. If you're struggling or considering dropping out, make an appointment with your advisor to weigh all of your options. Competitive bowling is now a new way to build a social group here in central New York. With more than 30 teams in one tournament, on TV updates, Bianca Gonzalez has more. There's a large variety of people taking on the competitive bowling life. From children to people with disabilities, and now the new trend of golfers joining the sport during the winter, competitive bowling is now a new social group. Nasima Adams has been bowling for most of her life, first as a hobby, but now as a fierce competitor. Her accomplishments in tournaments is bringing its way to social media websites like Facebook and Twitter. With social media and her license to bowl, Adams says her circle of friends is getting bigger. Like, these are the people I bowl with on Tuesday. Tomorrow I'll be bowling again at a different bowling alley. So there's a group of friends over there, and you know, all people come from all walks of life that bowl. With over 25 bowling alleys in central New York, places like Lakeview Lanes and Strike and Spare are seeing a huge number of increasing competitors, with 135 entries in last month's doubles tournament. As cash prizes go up, so does friendly competition. I'm Bianca Gonzalez on TV Update. To find out how you get into a league, check out your local bowling alley or just by going onto the Syracuse Bowling Association website. 
We've got uh, Tim Lewis back in the studio with the weekend weather forecast. Tim, how does it look out there? Oh, uh, well, it's going to be a great weather compared to what it's been. Today it's going to be partly sunny with a high around 20 degrees. Um, with winds coming out of the southwest at around 10, 5 to 10 miles per hour. Saturday, Saturday it's going to be mostly cloudy with about 40% chance of snow showers and with a high around the mid-30s. And Sunday is going to be the nicest of the weekend. It will be partly sunny with highs in the mid-30s. So if you are planning on any kind of event, Sunday would be the day to do it. All right, then. Well, sounds like we are finally getting a break from those sub-zero temps. Well, from all of us here at, on TV Update, thanks for watching. I'm Michael Knight. And I'm Mason Merritt. That's all we have for On TV News. We'll see you in this time next week.